Praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a good hand of praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's all stand this morning as we get ready to celebrate the presence of the Lord. We want to welcome you on behalf of our pastor, Pastor Luisa's sister Judy, to our celebration service. And what, what it is, it's Sunday mornings. We come together to celebrate all the great things God has done throughout the week. How many can say amen to that? God has been good. God has came through. God has been gracious to us, and that's what we come to celebrate his holy name. Amen. We're going to lift up the service in a word of prayer, but if you have a special prayer need, go ahead and lift it up before the presence of God. We're going to ask God to come and to minister in a special way here today and enlighten the load. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, we come before your presence. We're so grateful and thankful for everything you're doing and everything you've done within our lives. Lord, we lift up every, every prayer request, every, everyone that's heavy laden here today. God, we pray that you would minister in a special way. As we get into the word and we get into worship, you would get into us and do something powerful and everlasting. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, Amen. put your hands together for the presence of the Lord here today. Let's worship together. God bless you. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody put those hands together all over this place. Give God some praise. Come on, Victory Outreach, put those hands together. He's faithful. He's worthy. Come on.
this morning such a beautiful spirit here that's it in your own words just talk to him this morning oh come on if you know that heavenly language just begin to speak in that heavenly language that language that unleashes heaven come on some of you need strength from God some of you you're at a deciding decision making place in your life and you need the direction of God. Right now, lift your hands all over this place. Because we're going to sing, You are my strength. You are my strength. Come on. Strength like no Strength like no
drink like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Oh. Come on, lift up those hands. Come on, lift up those hands. Come on, give it to God this morning. Oh, come on, lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Come on, online, lift up the name of Jesus. Oh, come on, celebrate the King. Come on, if he's been your strength, if he's been your hope, come on, somebody. If he's bringing you through, come on, give the Lord one more hand of praise this morning. Come on, give the Lord a good hand of praise this morning. Somebody smile at somebody this morning. Look at your neighbor. You can smile at him. I know we like, we're missing the, the hug and, and we want to shake their hand. But right now, we're just going to smile, amen, as we take our seats. And online, we want to greet you. We want to welcome you uh, to Victory Outreach. Amen. Thank you for tuning in online this morning, amen. On behalf of our pastors, Pastor Luis and Sister Judy, and those that made it to the house of the Lord. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but there's no better place to be than in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's, it's so awesome. And the presence of God is here. And our prayer is that the presence of God has infl infiltrated your home this morning. Amen. We believe that God has a powerful word for you and I. Amen. And so real quick, we want to uh, just make a few things available to the church. We've got a few announcements. Amen. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, our gang girls. Amen. Where'd they go? Our gang girls to make their way. Come on, give the Lord a good hand. As they make their way, amen, they got a special plug, amen, for the gang girls, for the gang, amen. So they're going to share right now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hello. I'm, I'm one of the gang girl leaders, and we just wanted to announce Choose Purity for all the gang girls. is starting tonight at 5 p.m. for the young adults and high schoolers. So just get excited. It's free on Zoom. <laughs> get excited so we just want to invite you guys out to join tonight for our high school a young adult just come on if you need more information you could text me I could give you the zoom code and everything amen and then also on Thursday we'll be having our gang girl for the new gen which is the junior hires and that'll be on Thursday at 6 p.m. so make sure that if you want to join you can contact me or Talia and we can give you the code for that and um, just in case you guys don't know what Choose Purity is, it's a thing we do annually with the gang girls. And we basically make a commitment to God to wait until marriage. And um, I know me personally, it has changed my life. I've been following this commitment for the past six years now. And I know that it's important and I want to be able to instill this into these girls. So I really encourage you to um, have your girls just come out to these classes. And it, they're free, so um, try and join. So, yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Amen. Praise the Lord. So invite. Amen. Invite. Invite. And you know, uh, if you have a young adult, a young, a young woman of God, make sure they're there. Make sure they hear and take these uh, classes and starting tonight on Zoom. Now, somebody say October 29th. October 29th, amen, we want to invite you out, uh, Victory Outreach Hammett, uh, to the church in uh, Torre, Torre Fuerte, amen, <laughs> hopefully I said that right, Torre Fuerte, amen, church in Lake Elsinore, and our very own pastor is going to be ministering the word of God, amen, right there in the city of Lake Elsinore, and I don't know if you know or if you caught wind, but God is doing a work in Lake Elsinore, amen, God is bringing people, God has even called, we feel the call, amen. And the call like never before there needs to be a victory outreach and we believe that God is opening up many doors and this is one of them amen so our pastor is going to be able to share uh, in that city so we want to invite you on October the 29th at 7 p.m. at Torre Fuerte Church amen if you need more information on that you can see brother uh, Darius or, or brother Douglas amen they'll get you the address and, and everything like that amen so also we want you to stay tuned somebody says stay tuned tuned. Stay seated if you're in the house, amen, or here, amen, because uh, as many of you know, we've been in run for hope mode. We've been raising finances for world missions, and man, our church has broken records, amen, and so we, man, we've been, we broke a record in our church, 
Amen. And we're just believing God that it's going to get better and better. And so, look, we want to encourage you to stay here because we are uh, our, our uh, United We Can coordinators are going to be announcing the uh, the giveaway winners. Amen. And as you can see right here to my left, amen, they got an awesome huge TV that I pray I win. Come on, somebody. They got a computer and, and a few other prizes. So if you are a contributor uh, uh, to uh, to these um, these fundraisers, we want to let you know that there's an opportunity. So stay tuned. You might win. Come on, somebody. Online. Amen. If you're watching online and there's many people that sponsored you, you wrote their name on the ticket, let them know to jump on right after or even now. Amen. If you want to start a watch party, amen, let them know because today we're going to be doing the giveaway. And so we want to just thank you so much on behalf of our pastors for participating. And I'll let them share the rest. Come on, somebody. Uh, uh, as far as the details of what we raised. Uh, but we also want to just mention, amen, right before our pastor comes up to do the offering is that our kids gang. Amen. Someone say kids gang. Amen. We're going to be opening up. We're going to continue. Uh, we're going to be opening up. Uh, the day is November the 8th. Amen. So starting on November the 8th, which is a Sunday morning, we're going to be opening up to all the congregation. Amen. Of course, it's register. You got to register them. You got to answer the questionnaires. But we want to let you know that we're going to be opening it up for everyone. Uh, we, we feel confident, amen, that our team ha has been, uh, you know, just cleansing the rooms and, and making it safe. And so thank you so much for, for just being patient with us. I know some of us were seeing the kids in there were like, how come I can't? But we want to let you know we want to be safe. We want to keep the safety first. That's our number one priority, amen, to the house of the Lord, amen. And so we want to just uh, thank you so much. November 8th, we will be opening up. And at this time, amen, I'm going to ask you to direct your attention to the screen uh, as our pastor gets ready to make his way for the offering. God bless you this morning. God bless you once again on behalf of my wife and I. We just want to say thank you for all of you that are right now logged in. And like we said, the service is for you. And uh, we just want you to feel welcome. And my wife and I, we pray for you. And one of these days, soon, everything is going to be back to, I don't know if we can say normal, but uh, back again together. And uh, yesterday we were there and down here we had a big rally, the churches and everything and coming together uh, because sometimes things get a little bit ridiculous, amen? And so God has called us to preach. And I believe one of the things that provoked me to when we first started and then again, and then they shut us down again. And I said, we have to open. I was in San Diego Pastor Al over there, and he had a tent and all that. But I said, we can't put a tent out here, especially in summertime. Uh, be 110 out there. Uh, be crazy. But there's people that, that are not going to be able to hang just by watching on TV and your phone or whatever. Amen. And so God just put that burden and says, no, no, there's people that need to be here. They need the fellowship. And so that's why, and as you can see, uh, one of the things is our children's ministry, uh, Kids Gang, uh, they're going all the way 
And so right now we've been testing uh, because of uh, this thing, the COVID and all that, but they went out. They have these foggers and think professional foggers that they just go in and this thing sprays everything, disinfects and the whole thing, amen? And so we're doing all this for you. We don't want you, you know, or not only that, but sometimes people don't feel comfortable. And, and so this way you can start relaxing a little bit more. And yes, we do ask people that come and for altar call, whatever, put your mask on and all those things. I put my mask on and so on, amen? But right now what I want to do is honor the Lord with our giving. Amen. So you can get excited. Come on now. And for those that are watching online, you can go into our vohemet.org website. And right there, you're going to see uh, three ways you can give there online and through Zelle, uh, PayPal, or text to tithe. Amen. And then also, uh, some people still bring their envelopes here during services. And... Uh, this is a perfect time, I believe. This is a perfect time to give. Why do I say that? Because some of you probably say, Pastor, don't you understand in jobs and all this? Well, this is why. What do you think we have the example of the, the poor widow with the two mics that Jesus says, that's all she has, and then she gives, amen? And so because this is where we're tested, it's easy, it's very easy for each one of us when there's plenty to give. So yeah, I can give, but when it hurts, that's when Jesus wants to say, okay, let me see. And that's when he rewards and he blesses your life. And, and that's the only way that you and I can actually see the hand of God move upon our lives. Amen. And I, I learned throughout the years, it's not always about money, that I get money and then I get money back. No, no. Suddenly nobody gets sick in my house. My car doesn't break down. You know, little things like that, you know. Uh, Things in the house, you know, say your, your uh, water heater blows up. You know, things like they don't, they don't happen, but we don't even pay attention, but it's because God, I said God, is protecting us. He's blessing us for that. So we don't have to have extra, you know, expenses here and there and all that because that's what the enemy does. He'll bring. And I'm not saying that the enemy's going to just blow up your water heater, but what I'm saying is that he'll use things that... To, in other words, like that, you're making, you get your, your, your finances, and then suddenly, now you got to pay $200 for this, and now you got to pay this. Then suddenly, by the end, you're behind now. And you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? My next check's not even going to make it. I'm still $500 in the hole. And I know what it means to live a blessed life. I wasn't always a pastor, I was a guy that got saved. And after that, we ran the homes for a couple of years. And then I went straight to work. And I worked until I got lunched out. Actually, when I got lunched out, a friend of ours that had a company says, where are you going? Hemet. He goes, I got people down there, oxygen. He goes, I'll pay you for the miles. I'll pay you for gas and just deliver the oxygen. And I'll pay you for that too. But not only that, but in my job, in my job, I remember getting my check and I would be surprised, like, wow, are we getting paid again? Why? Because I wasn't worrying. I wasn't thinking, man, I, I hope it's Thursday so I can get my check because I got to buy a house, all kinds of things. The American dream, God provided for the American dream. But I always had it in the back of my head, my wife and I always had this in our hearts, that one day Jesus is going to come and ask us, are you willing to let it go? so you can do my work. So that's why we never got attached to possessions because the day came when he says, you're ready? You're ready to go? Let's go. And here we are. It's been 20 years, amen? And God has provided, has blessed and everything. So if God is able to do it for us, he can do it for you, amen? Are you guys ready? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray, God. Help us, God, because the Word tells us that we need to be good stewards, good managers, God, because in reality, everything belongs to you, God. Even our next breath is in your hands, Father. And so I pray right now, God, 
Bless this offering. Bless those that are about to give, God. And we thank you for this precious opportunity. And the people of God said, Amen. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. And I'm going to start reading in verse 15. And the, this month and these months actually, we've, talk, we've been talking about kingdom living. Amen. That's our theme. Say amen when you're there. Verse 15. This passage right here, Paul is talking about, and I'm going to look right now, the analogy that, that he uses about slaves. He uses the word slaves. It says, what then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obey from the heart that, that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you present your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawless, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray once again, Lord, help me to bring forth your word. Open our hearts and our minds, God, and help us to realize, Father, what Paul is talking about, Lord when it comes to kingdom living, God. Father, we thank you, and we all say, Amen. Amen. What does it mean to have freedom? That's the title of my message. And it's interesting how Paul, you can see as we were reading right now that passage of Scripture, the word slave, its use, So as we look at the, or before we look into the, the details of Paul's analogy, it is helpful to notice in verse 19 his specific reason for using slavery as a reference. He says, because of the weakness of your flesh. And he begins this analogy here in verse 16 and then offers in verse 19 his reason for using it. It starts with the slaves. He is simply doing what a good teacher would do to bring understanding and to find a point of common ground 
with his students that will move, uh, in other words, with this concept that he's dealing with death to sin from the abstract to the round to which is concrete. In other words, he's saying it's not just an idea, this thing that I'm talking to you about. It's a reality. It's not just something that you just, you know, kind of like imagine in your head. No, 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 no. You guys are slaves to sin or you were slaves to sin at one time. What did it produce? But now, as you have become slaves to righteousness, it will produce eternal life in Jesus Christ. So it's not an idea, he's saying. This is not just, let me put this, and that's why I'm going to share too why he uses this terminology. Because he's speaking to the church in Rome. And slavery would have been a, a good analogy to almost any person that Paul was able to address in his day. Because this, slavery was a general practice. That's why we see Paul writing the, the letter to Philemon. It's about slavery. Onesimus was a slave, ran away, burned his master. Philemon or Philemon, if you want to call him. And he says, yeah, Onesimus, which means profitable. And he even uses a, a change of words. He says, and, you know, he says, once he was unprofitable, but now he has become profitable to you. So he uses, he's just a slave. He burned you, yes. Even though his name is profitable, but he wasn't living up to his name. That's how I got to meet him in jail when he came to jail and I was in jail. And so we can see this, these things even in Philippians and all that. Paul uses uh, many times the word slave or bondservant sometimes, which is different. And so what I'm saying is that this subject of slavery was actually, actually appropriate to his Listeners in Rome, because the number of slaves in the city, historically, it has been estimated that perhaps the majority of the population of Rome was made up of slaves of one kind or another. Are you hearing me? Indeed, some, if not many, of the believers in the, ch in the church in Rome were slaves. See, the thing is you and I have a certain mentality when it comes to slaves because that's what has been portrayed to us in the Western culture, that they have you tied up and chained and this and that. And there were different types of slaves. There were some slaves that, in other words, they would sell themselves because they had it good. They say, hey, you take care of me. I'll be right here. I'll be your slave. In other words, your servant. That will be a bond servant. I'll, be your, I'll serve you until I die. I, I'm... I'm even with, with the Jews, it has like that. That's why after many times what would happen is somebody in the family would become the slave of somebody else because they, they loan money or whatever, help the whole family. So then the, after the seven years, that was, it was squashed. But then we would have, you know, they would say, you know what, I, I, I don't want to go home. I want to stay here with you. You've been a good master to me. You've been a, a good person to me. And I don't care. I'll stay here. And that's why they would pierce their ear. They were pierced their ear and saying that I'm a bond servant. I choose to be a slave to this family. Did they treat you in chains and that? No. It's like you would become part of the family. Yet you knew your place. And you would do things because you were grateful. And I think this is one of the things that Paul is trying to communicate to us that, in other words, yeah, we were slaves to sin, and what did it do to us? I know for myself, I lost dignity, I lost everything. But as soon as I came to Jesus, he started restoring these things. And the reason I serve him wholeheartedly is not because I'm a pastor, it's not because of this, no, because I'm grateful of what he has done in my life. I am grateful that he was willing to touch my life. And so I said, Jesus... Pierce my ear, and I'll serve you for the rest of my life. There were some, like I said, slaves that were, and there were slaves against their will. And these were most of the time prisoners of war or those that volunteered to be slaves. 
more in the order of household servants who had a, a legal agreement or some type of contract to a household for the purpose of their well-being or survival. There were some that say maybe they were prisoners of war, and then after a while, they, they got to know the family, they got to know this and that, and then suddenly say, I, I, I got nowhere to go. I don't want to go back to my land. I don't want to do that. I want to stay here. Is that all right? I'll serve you. And it's interesting, interesting how Paul uh, would address both types of servants in this passage. Though the voluntary servant is his primary focus, based on what he writes in Romans chapter 5. He says, everyone is born a slave to sin without choice of will. His primary focus here, however, is the death to sin that allows the voluntary offering of oneself to another master for service. Did you hear me? So it's like a bond servant that at one time we were slave. We didn't have choice. We're born to sin. When we, you and I are born, we're already slaves to sin. We're already stamped. We're already marked. Are you hearing me? He says, but now that Jesus has come into your life and has redeemed you, bought you back, and you're no longer a slave to sin, my advice to you is to choose to become a slave to righteousness. Volunteer yourself to this new master, which is Jesus Christ. Let me say that slavery to God leads to righteousness and eternal life. When you choose, see, that's, I think that's, and I'm going to get into that because it's very interesting, this passage, because many of us, in other words, we just have this thing like we get saved and all that, but we really don't think about it. We don't, we don't think about now, man, I'm, I'm a new person. I'm a new creation. Man, God, God has delivered maybe in the beginning and all that, but later on, it just becomes a normal life, normal thing. And we don't even realize we wake up and we just think we're free. We shouldn't think like that. Every morning, I have to wake up and remind myself that I am a bond servant to Jesus Christ. That what I'm doing is because I love him, I am grateful for everything that he has done for me. See, one of the most unusual things for foreigners that visit our country is the incredible number of choices we have, especially as consumers. The rest of the world simply doesn't have them. And we can say that choices are multiplying every day. For example, between 1975 and 2008, the number of products in, in the average supermarket swelled from an average of 8,948 to almost 47,000 choices. Before, in those years, you would go to buy toothpaste, and you would have what? Colgate, Crest, Pepsi, then probably. Now you go and you got about 10 choices of Colgate. <laughs> Cavity stopper, this and that, whitener, and all kinds of stuff. And, all, and I mean, you look at the aisle and toothpaste, toothpaste, all this stuff. Sometimes you come there and you just stare, especially the guys, we get there and we just stare. Okay, can you get some toothpaste, honey? Sure. And we just get there and like, there's a lot of toothpaste here, babe. They have this, they have that, they have this, they have that. Which one? The average household in 1975 was able to get probably six TV channels. Today, you get probably about 500. It is believed that it's, 
that every year there's probably 20 new religions pop up here in the United States. Some survive, some just live for a season. So what I'm saying is that never in the history of mankind has any group of people had the choices that you and I have here in America. That we are privileged to have all this today. Even though right now we may be complaining, we might be this, but you and I don't have it as bad as just crossing the border. I say this because it's true. If you have hot water, if you have a refrigerator, if you have a bathroom inside your house, if you have a stove, gas, or electric, you're privileged. You're privileged. Because as soon as you cross the border, there's houses that don't have the bathroom inside. It's outside. They don't have running water. They have these big drums where they fill with water, get buckets, and that's how they shower. They wash dishes, wash clothes, and all that. Insulation is just a bunch of flat uh, bottle caps, and they nail them in the walls outside. And we complain that we have it bad. But the thing is, is that, that some people would define freedom as to having a choice, to having many choices. That's why when they come into Christianity or something, it's, it's like, well, what about my choices? What about this? What about that? Even now, to choose whether or not to complete a pregnancy. To choose, what, my right to choose what substance I take into my body. That's my choice. To choose who, how many, or what sex my sexual partners are. That's my choice. That's my right. Sometimes... Uh, some people view Christianity as something full of restrictions or something that is going to suppress our freedom. I remember when I barely, barely got saved, it's like, I can't smoke. That's my right. Can't have a beer? One? Can't have one beer? I'm not going to get drunk, just one beer. No, you can't. You're a Christian now. There's my freedom. Yet I was slave to sin to the max, destroying my life. But the question is, does choice equal freedom? Think about it. And the answer to this is found here, Romans chapter 6. Verses 1 and 2. We're going to see a view of freedom. One look. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we, how can we who die to sin still live in it? And there's a twisted view when it comes down to freedom. They say that the gospel gives us freedom to sin because grace is greater than all my sin. Because Paul writes in Romans 5.20 that, that where there is an increase in sin, there is an even greater increase in grace. He says there where their sin abounds, in other words, Grace abounds way more. And so people are saying, you know, well, it means that, that, that even though I'm in sin, but, you know, that, that all I have to do is just let the grace of God come and then he'll, he'll take care of it. So this question was bound to arise. In other words, why not continue in sin so that the greatness of God's grace may be seen more fully. This question probably came up 
group of people, antinomians, that purposely misinterpret the doctrine of justification by faith as providing an excuse for a sinful lifestyle. Antinomian, it's a view that Christians are released by grace from the obligation of observing the moral law. They're saying, now that I am in Jesus, Jesus is going to take care of everything. Now that I am in Jesus, I don't have to worry about repenting and all that. All I can do, I mean, if I sin, I sin. Whatever I do, whatever I do, hey, so what? Big deal. Jesus is going to take care of it. W. Barclay writes these words against such perverted implication. He says, how despicable it would be for a son to consider himself free to sin because he knew that his father would forgive. And see, that's the danger that many times you and I, we get into this pattern of continual sinful lifestyle expecting that God is so loving, so caring, that he's just going to he's just gonna continue forgiving, 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 and forgiving. One day you're going to fall short of the grace of God. And all hell is going to break loose. So you got to remember this. There is cause and effect. Cause and effect. Everything that you and I do is going to bring a response, either good or bad. Just like if you, if you devote your life to Christ and all this, well, guess what? You're going to reap good things. Even though you might be a Christian now, you, you claim to be a Christian, but yet you're dipping into sin. Guess what? You're going to reap out of that. I always think that sometimes people is like this. It's like, you know, like if, if, if somebody is unfaithful and does that and the, and the girl becomes pregnant and all this, and just because they come to the altar and they repent, like the girl is going to become unpregnant. <laughs> and everything's going to go like back to, back to time and everything's fixed. No. Sin will take its course. The child, in other words, it, it came out of sin. It's not his fault or her fault. But what I'm saying is that you are going to be forgiven, yeah, for your action like that. But it doesn't mean that it's going to just fix everything around. Consequences are coming your way. And so the thing is, what I'm trying to communicate here is that many times we have this ideology in our head that because God is love, God is good, that I can just sin and run amok and all this and then just come to church and repent and everything is okay. But tomorrow, here we go again. It is also possible that this question came from some Jews. Because they believed that the doctrine of salvation by faith alone would encourage moral irresponsibility. And I think that's what happens sometimes. We're no, we're, we haven't been responsible, or you know, taking re, full responsibility for our moral actions, or lack of moral actions, I should say. And Paul doesn't deny that God's grace has no limits. But yet Paul denies that sinning is your right of freedom. He doesn't say, yeah, you've been set free from sin, but that doesn't give you the right to continue to sin. Verse 3 is telling us that we have died in Christ. As a matter of fact, Listen to me, a funeral has taken place and you and I were the guest of honor. They say that Christians have a two-part biography. Volume one, the old man in sin. Volume two, the new man in Christ. Volume one ended with a death and burial. Volume two begins with a resurrection. 
You are a new man. You are a new woman in Christ. Live like that. Got to remember that sin never gives what it promises. Right? So why do we continue to play with it? Why do we continue playing with sin? I think for many of us it's because we haven't felt the wrath of God yet. I think that, the, in other words, sin has not really knocked us down. I mean, beat us up bad. That's why we still think that we can get away with it. See, those are, and I'm going to use the term so we can understand here. There's still dolphin moves. I know some of you probably don't understand what I'm, I just said. You remember doing some dolphin moves? I'm trying. <laughs> Jiving, conniving, no, and you, come on. Some of you guys, when you were women, you were masters of playing chess up here in your head. This, this, this I'm going to get this responding like that. He knew how to set up everything. And you play with a straight poker face that, yes, babe, oh, whatever. It's like, yeah, and then suddenly you get your way, like, yeah. Why do we continue to play with it? Sin never brings nothing good. It always brings destruction. That's the outcome of it. That, that's the purpose. Basically, we want to say it like that. The purpose of sin is to bring destruction. Not happiness, not this. It's destruction. In some way, somehow, we expect that we're going to reap something great. No. There's always consequence. You always have to... The payday's going to come. Let me give you an illustration here. If you're going to boat or whatever, and they're going to tell you not to, to never drink seawater, no matter how thirsty you get. Especially if you have become dehydrated. If you ignore the warnings and, start, and you start drinking uh, seawater, you're going to die. You're going to die. Now, let me explain. A good drink of seawater contains, listen to me, seven times more salt than the body can safely take in. Why do you think the body's asking us to drink water? To flush the salt. Ironically, a person dehyd that is dehydrated because... What happens when a person is dehydrated, the kidneys demand more water to flush salt out. So the more salt water you continue to drink, the thirstier, thirstier you will get, and you will die. And that's the way sin is. It will never give you what it promises Never. So those who are in Christ, you and I need to see ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. Now verses 11 and, and to 14. He says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Consider the word. In other words, this word, consider. 
ESB. King James, reckon. NIV uses count. And the, this word here, so you also must consider, or so you also must count, or so you also must reckon, has to do with your brain, with your mind. Because most of the time, we have become part of this life of Christianity, and we actually don't think about it. We just react. Have you ever seen, a, uh, as, as a minister, I have the privilege sometimes, like when I marry a couple, and then after, after they get married and the whole thing, you hear them say, wow, I'm married now. Wow. And then the guys come to the guy and say, hey, dude, you're married now, dude, you're married. So, you know, it's just sinking in their mind. I'm no longer, you know, free or this or that, you know, bachelor or whatever. I'm married now. I'm married. And you hear them say this constantly, like, they're like, wow, I'm married. And they look at the ring and, man, I'm married. Wow. And, are you listening to me? Do you guys remember that? I'm married now. Or did you forget already you're married? It's just a habit. See, that's the same thing. It was a big thing then. Like, wow, and you're trying to make sense. Man, and I'm married, and now together, and we're going to do things together, and now this and that, and we're going to do this and that. But now it's been some years. Where are you going to go? I'm going to go over there. Where are you going to go? I'm going to go over here. Some of you probably have separate rooms. Yeah, we're still married. But I have my room because I like my things. And he likes his things. Yeah, she likes her things. And uh, yeah, it's better like this. We come together there. We meet together in the living room. Watch TV together. But then the game comes, so I go to my room. Then the telenovelas come, and I go to my room. And that's the guy's. The question is, do we feel like we are dead to sin? I don't think so. See, Jesus Christ is our example. By his death, he ended once and for all, listen to me, all his relationship to sin. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, he became sin for us. Suddenly the sins of the world were placed on him. Him who knew no sin had to carry the sins of mankind, past, present, and future. As he dealt with that, and he rose from the dead, transformed and everything, he doesn't have to deal with this no more. Everything is established now. Justification, grace, all that, sanctification, the whole thing. Everything was set in course. That's the beauty when you see in the Mount of Transfiguration that you see two people, Moses and Elijah, appear to him and the apostles see, and then suddenly he's transformed and, and the deity of him just starts I can't even imagine, but I think like just like rays of light start coming out of him, just suddenly he's transformed into deity. And what these two men are doing, one represents the law, one represents the prophets, and it's, they're cheering him on. Hey, this is going to take place, the fulfillment of every prophecy, the fulfillment of the law. When you are nailed to the cross, everything is going to take place. Everything is going to come into action. And once again, man will have that relationship with God like it was meant to be from the beginning. Come on, give the Lord a good hand. So now Jesus Christ lives forever in an unbroken fellowship with God. And this is the thing, in the same way, wrote Paul, we are to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. 
Like I said, when Jesus died for our sins, he also died to sin. That's why now you and I have to take our place with him and start looking at sin as something that you and I have to die also. Let it go. The only reason sin continues to have power over your life is because you seek for that. Don't tell me that you don't have the power to resist sin. If you're telling me and trying to tell me that you don't have the power, it's because really you're not in Christ then. Because if you are in Christ, then Christ is in you. Holy Ghost is right there with you and will empower you, will convict you, will protect you. The reason why we fall into sin is because we still love to sin. And I say this and I'll say it again. Why did I sin? Without, why did I become a dope fiend and all? I loved it. I was telling somebody the other day, you know what it was, man? Sometimes I knew I was getting some bunk, but it wasn't the bunk, it was the ritual. I'm getting my thing there, sitting down, putting my little altar and looking at it and the smell. And I don't want to go further. But that's what it was. It was a ritual that I would do. Some of you know, putting the cacharro right there and uh, everything, like, it's a little ritual. That's what it was. I was worshiping this thing. And many times I knew it was bunk, but it was just the going through the motions. That's what I would seek. I would go after that. And if I would get loaded, it was a bonus. But what I'm saying is this, that, that, that now in Christ, that thing doesn't move me anymore. You can put heroin right there. You can put booze right there. You can put this right. It doesn't move me anymore. I've been set free. <laughs> Yet at the same time, now we're, we're, okay, we're no longer, you know, drug addicts and all that. But what about pride? What about greed? What about selfishness? What about anger? What about bitterness? Those have their little altars too. But what I'm trying to tell you, this is what Paul is saying. The reason why you continue to sin is because you want to sin. Or you take the grace of God for granted. You take salvation, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for you and I, we take it so lightly like ain't nothing. We're not supposed to live a life that continues to sin during the week. Then on Sunday, we come to church to ask and receive forgiveness from God. That's not the pattern. That's not what Jesus died for. It's like some way, a, a way out every week. Because remember, you're going to be forgiven. Yeah. We can't deny that. But the consequences are going to hit you sooner or later. See, listen to me. Paul was not suggesting that we imitate Christ. Listen to me. Listen to me. Paul was not suggesting that we imitate Christ like a child imitating his father or mother, just pretending to be like them. And that's what so many of us, we strive for. We just want to imitate Christ. And it was just pretend but yet there's no repentance, no true repentance. There's no, you know, in other words, efforts to stop living the way we used to live. He was speaking of a reality that took place when, when you and I, by faith, we were incorporated or merged into Christ. So from that moment on, our responsibility is to take very seriously the fact that to be in Christ now you and I have to die to sin. How many times? Every single day. Did I forget how to sin? Did you forget how to sin? 
If you say you do, I want to talk to you after the service. <laughs> Temptation is never going to go away. Never. Never. If it's my arise ontologically or within our nature or being, we are united with Christ through faith and baptism. Christians must deepen their faith continually to become more and more, listen to me, psychologically aware of that union. It's like I said, it's not based on emotions. It's a psychological thing that you and I have to come to this place where we understand that really, like I read that scripture in the past here, that in other words, you have to count, that really think about it. Like I said, the example of a couple getting married and they're able to say, man, wow, and it's hitting them psychologically. They're realizing that, wow, I am married, uh, this and that, and all these things and expectations are going to come and all that. But really, it's here. And how many of us have gone to that place in our Christian walk that we actually realize psychologically that we are no longer sinners, that we have been saved by grace, that we are in Christ, that the Holy Ghost, that the Trinity, the triune God lives in us, that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's why we have to consider ourselves dead to the appeal and power of sin and alive to God through our union with Jesus Christ. They say that if, a, listen to me, they say that if a Christian chooses to sin, it is the spiritual equivalent of digging up a corpse for some fellowship. And some of you continue to go to your friends that are still dead in sin to have fun. It's like going to a bunch of corpses, you know, that are there to have some fun. What does life have to do with death? Why do you continue to seek that that is dead? Why? I think because you haven't realized who you are in Christ. You're still based on emotions. And whatever your emotions dictate that morning, that's where you go. And you don't even think about it until you catch yourself right there, like, man, here, oh, man. And the sad thing is, human beings, when you catch yourself like this, we don't repent, right? Oh, man, I better not. We go like, ah, well, whatever, it's too late now. Hello. So every time you choose to sin, remember, it's the spiritual equivalent of digging up a corpse for fellowship. That's what I'm saying. It, 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 we have to, what he's communicating here is, it, it, and that's why he uses the analogy of slavery, because these people knew what he was talking about, about being a slave, most of them being slaves one type or the other. They know what it means to be under. They know what it means to submit. And they know what it is to submit to somebody and give your life because you want to, you choose to be a slave for somebody. And that's why he uses the analogy like that. It's not an emotional thing. They knew mentally what it meant to be a slave. And he uses this to communicate this heavy-duty principle that many of us don't catch it even though we have been slaves to sin for I don't know how long, yet we never realize. We always thought that we had it under control. We always thought that I got it together. I can fix it whenever I want to know. No. You were just ignorant to the reality of the power of sin. And when I say you, me, too. Any force? See, a genuine death to sin means that the entire perspective, listen to me, how you view things, everything, perspective of the believer has 
been radically transformed. If you're still thinking the way, if a guy in the home, and he's been there five months, three months, and he still thinks like when he came in the first day, it's because nothing has happened in his life yet. If you're here in church and you've been here and you're still acting like the first day you came to church is because ain't nothing happened yet in your life. Don't tell me you're a Christian. Don't tell me you're a believer. That's what they say, a perspective, or they call a paradigm shift. The way you think, the way you filter things. The way when I was in the world, I used to filter things very corrupt, perverted, and everything. Always, I'm like, let me see what I'm going to get. What do I get out of this one? I used to think all the time, where is this going to go? Where do I get? I don't want to get burned. No, if anything, I'll burn somebody, but I'm not going to get burned. It was always about gaining, about this, and advantage, and all that kind of stuff. But when I came to Christ, and I'm not going to say the first day, it took some months and so on, then suddenly in the ranch, I realized, like, I can't think like that anymore. I have to change the way I see things. That's a paradigm. It shifts now. And that's what I'm saying. The perspective of the believer has to be radically transformed. If little knick-knack things still move you, you're still in the flesh. You're still thinking carnal. See, it doesn't matter. Listen to me. It doesn't matter if you feel that you're saved or not. It doesn't matter. Christ, our Christian walk is not based on emotions, feelings. It doesn't matter. Like I say, if you're married, it doesn't matter if you feel married or not after a year. Maybe after a month. It's not based on how you feel. I don't feel married today. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You got a ring. There's a certificate there that says, yeah, you're married. And the certificate says, it doesn't matter if you feel it or not. Look at your hand. You're married. You're still married. Doesn't matter if you feel it or not. Same thing. If you... Give your life to Christ, and now you let Christ do what he has to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter if you feel saved this morning or not. You just let God be God. And you pray, God, help me today. I don't feel saved. Man, my mind is going crazy today. I'm not thinking like a Christian today. Jesus, help me. Change this, please. And in verses 15 to 23, he goes to slavery to God. Verses 16 has given us something very interesting. There's only two choices. He says, do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slave, slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. He's telling us slaves to sin leads to death. Slaves to righteousness leads to life. He's saying, look, let, let me put it like this, he goes. You guys know what it means to be a slave? Yeah. Any free slaves here? In other words, bond servants and all that? Yeah, all right. How many of you came from being a prisoner of war and all that? Yeah. What are you now? A bond servant. All right. So you knew the difference, right, from being a, a slave because you were a prisoner of war, and now you know the difference, how it feels to be a slave because you're a bond servant. You choose. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I'm saying. You're going to be a slave anyway, but you're going to choose. You continue to be a slave to sin, or you continue to be a slave to righteousness because you choose to be one. But the outcome is going to be totally different. One is death, the other one is life. So which one you want to be? 
What he's saying, there's no, I'm free now. No, 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 no. You're still a slave, my friend. That's what he's saying. But a slave to righteousness. See, the thing is that when we hear these words like slaves to righteousness, it sounds like it brings limits. Because we tend to think, believe, that freedom means having a bunch of choices. That's why I want to tell all roads lead to Jesus. Every religion leads to Jesus. Oh, you don't have to worry about it. No. There's only one Jesus Christ, came from heaven, son of God, full God, full man, died on the cross. On the third day he rose. And he said this, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He made it clear. He didn't say, okay, you guys, I'm going to die for sin, but hey, if you don't like the way I might think, you can go through Buddha, you can go through this, you can go through that. No, he says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's, that's a very clear statement. Come on, give the Lord a good hand. See, what I'm trying to say here is that as humans, we continue to flatter ourselves. We pamper ourselves. We, we pat ourselves in the back, thinking that, nah, ain't nobody going to hold me down, man. Ain't nobody going to be telling me what to do. Ain't nobody going to, hello. We're not as free as we think. Try to run three red lights down the street. See what happens. I'm free. I don't need no. No, I'm not obedient to the man. Okay, show me. And I'll take a picture of you after you're in the black and white in the back seat. <laughs> you don't look free now, beloved. Years back, Pastor Fernando and the Fruits of Faith in San Bernardino, they used to sing a song. It was from Bob Dylan. He said, you're going to have to serve somebody. And they were talking about that. Serve the devil or Jesus, but you're going to have to serve somebody. There's nothing like, oh, I'm, no, you're going to serve somebody. And you need to get that in you right now. You're going to have to serve somebody. There's no way out of it. But the good news is this. You and I get to choose which side we want to be on. Just think for a moment real quick. I'm getting ready to close here. If you look back into your life before Christ, what was it really like? What was it really like? There's things that I can look back and there were some fun times and there were some good times. But I can say that it came a time where the majority of my time by then it was miserable. What I'm saying is what benefit did you reap from the things you are now ashamed? That's what Paul is saying. So what did you reap from all that madness when you were slaves to sin? Are you proud of it? Can you really boast about it? He's telling them, think about it. Just think about it. When you were slaves to sin, what did you reap? Can we say that Christianity has restrictions? Of course it does. But it's for our own good. Hey, it has restrictions the same way as a diet. Huh. You want, no, 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 you can't eat that anymore. But why not? It tastes good. No, no, no. You want to lose weight? Yeah, well, don't eat that. Restrictions. Exercise program has restrictions. Many things. The thing is, in the beginning, it seems like there are restrictions. We can't do this. We can, like I said, the beginning, we can't smoke. We can't this and all that. And, and, and it's, listen to me. 
people may say, well, where does it say, Pastor, you can't smoke? Where does it say you can't do this? Where does it say you can't? And some people use Timothy when, they, you know, I, I, he says to drink wine and all. Yeah, he says because you're sick. Timothy suffered like ulcer. He has something like that. So he would drink wine. They didn't have no, some people say, well, there was grape juice. For, you know, they didn't have that. It was wine. It was, this, that was the, to eat and the whole thing. That was the customs. But at the same time, Paul says, you know, like in, in Ephesians talks about that, don't be drunk, you know, with wine. And he's talking about influence. Don't be, be influenced by the Holy Spirit, but don't be, like, influenced by the wine. How many of you remember dancing on top of a table or stuff like that? <laughs> See, oh, you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about, huh? You got pictures of you. Ah, hello. <laughs> Party. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> back, you go, ah, whatever. That's influence. Your influence. And then we wake up the next day and like, don't talk to me. <laughs> Turn the TV down, it's too loud. And you say you had a good time. We didn't reap anything good. Like I said, there's restrictions for our own. What I'm trying to say is this. If you're an individual that comes to church, I can't tell you you can't drink. I can't tell you you can't smoke. I'm not going to tell you, oh, you can't do this. That's between you and God. If you're a leader, then I have a right to say, hey, hey, hey. We don't do that. In the Greek, this says, Cortatela. Stop. Stop. Why? Because we represent something now. But it's a member of just of the church, I'll just pray for you. And hey, I don't condemn you. Because sooner or later, the Holy Spirit is going to hit you. So let it go. Let it go. I'm going to go close with it. But let me say this real quick. I remember when I went to the ranch. I mean, I, 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 I got there. I was wasted when I got there. They even put me in the back of a pickup truck when they picked me up in Victorville. But I remember like about a week later, I, and it's, it's, it's crazy how when I was in San Diego, I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't stop getting, I, could, I would cry. I would see the 700 Club in the morning, and I would have two short dogs, two bottles of wine, and a brandy, a pint of brandy, and a snappy Tom and my vitamins. That was my breakfast. And I'll be watching the seven, and I will, because they will say, a word of knowledge right now is getting a broken arm or this or that. And I will say, God, and I will cry, please, please let them say that somebody's being delivered right now and stuff. Nothing. Like I said before, I used to actually believe that I was cursed. This is me, this is the way I'm going to die. When I got to the ranch, I was wasted. And I was thinking, I'm not going to make it in the morning. Probably going to have to leave. But God delivered me. It's like that. Like that. Since that day to today. But I remember that not even a week later, this is how quick God just moved. I was, I was in a top bunk like that, and then the, a new guy came, and he was right at the entrance of the door. So I was like from here to Darius. And I go like, hey, dude, are you smoking? And he goes, nah. And I was like, I can smell smoke, you know, the smoking, tobacco. And then I realized like, Wow. Before, I'll be smoking, and people will be smoking, and it never bothered me. I couldn't, like, smell it. Here I am, not even a week later, and I can smell somebody that's been smoking. And it's like, wow, you stink, bro. Stink like cigarettes. But see, that's what I'm saying. God was changing me. Changing me. Even smelling things now, and all this kind of stuff. I remember looking and seeing, like, the brightness and shiny things and like 
going to the store and I never looked at apples or stuff like that and suddenly like wow those are nice red apples man they're bright and shiny and all this kind of stuff it was God And these restrictions that God starts bringing is because it's leading us to something better and greater. Slavery to God is in our own best interests. Because freedom, listen to me, at least in the sense of having unlimited choices, is never good for us to have. I don't know about you, I made a lot of bad choices. I remember many times thinking, I got to stop doing this. I got to stop doing that. I'm going to have to stop doing this. And I will probably stop a week, two weeks, but there I go again. Why? Because I continued to be a slave to sin. And I close with this. You and I have two choices today. Same thing I mentioned. Slavery to sin that leads to death. Or slavery to God that leads to righteousness. And eternal life. When Jesus says in a life more abundant. He's not just saying when you and I die. But he says... A better life here on earth as you wait for your time to come up to me. And I can say, honestly say, God has given me a good life. Has there been problems? Yes. Struggles? Oh, yeah. But I'm not alone anymore. Not only I have family members and loved ones and people that care for me and I care for them. and No, no. He's with me. And I can sense his presence. Even though I might be alone and I'm I'm going through it, I can sense that he's with me. And that he's telling me, don't worry. Don't worry. Give it to me. And I'll take care of it. You just hang in there. Keep praying. Keep holding on, and I'll get you through. And as we stand, it comes down to this. It comes down to each one of us today. You have the power to make a choice. You still want to remain like that? Hey, we're here. And we'll be here for you. But if you say, you know what, enough is enough. I got to change this. It starts up here, like I said. Our mind has to change. We can't continue to operate with this worldly mentality. Try to bring our worldly concept to Christianity. It's not going to fit. It's not going to work. It doesn't. What helped me is when I realized that Christianity is not just something that I was able to add into my life. No. It is a lifestyle. Maybe some of you, you remember that you were growing up and your parents or whatever, but then you got to a certain age and then suddenly you became, you start gangbanging. That became a lifestyle. You start dressing different. You start talking different. You started thinking different, acting different, hanging around with different people that back that same lifestyle. Different lifestyles. Christianity is the same thing. We talk different, we think different, we act different. And we come together as one. Because all of us fall short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, no, not one. 
All of us need Jesus. All of us. Every single day. So what I want to do right now, for those that are here, if you want to make an altar call, put your mask on. And those that are watching right now, listen to me right there where you're at. For once, fall on your knees. Ask God, help me, God. I don't want to live like this no more. I want to change. Not just emotional. I want to change my mind. I, I need my mind to change, my perspective, everything. It needs to change. And for those here, if that's you, come on to the front. Let God be God. Come on. Oh, hallelujah, Lord Jesus. The name of Jesus See, I don't want to be the same. I don't want to be the same, God. I don't want to walk out the same. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Have your way. Have your way. Your name 
what I want to do right now. I don't know, but I feel some of you think like it's impossible to change. But I'm here to let you know. Just, I, I was like that. I thought I, I, and like I said, somebody, some Christian told me one time, maybe you're cursed. And when that person said that to me, it made sense. It was like, wow, no wonder I can't change. No wonder things don't happen. Other people got saved and every, and I couldn't. Couldn't let it go. Couldn't stop. I tried and I tried and I... So it made sense. I'm cursed. No wonder. No wonder. And actually, I, uh, when I say I believed, I, I gave into it. This, then why try? Why even, why even try? That's why I, I, at, the, at the end... shooting heroin, hoping to die. It was no longer just to get high. I was like, I hope, I hope on, I don't wake up on this one. This is it. Because I thought that, that man, I'm, the, I'm not going to change. This is it. But I'm grateful for men of God that told me that's a lie from the pits of hell. And it sparks something in me. What I'm saying is just like some of you right now, maybe you're watching me right now and you're thinking, Pastor, you don't understand. I've tried it I, over and over and over. And I can't change. Maybe some, somebody here right now, you think like that. You've been trying and trying, but some way, somehow, you end up going back to the Mari clay. And it doesn't have to be drugs. It can be jealousy. It can be bitterness. It can be anger, frustration. You keep going back. Somebody hurt you, and you keep replaying this thing over and over that it affects how you act, how you behave. And God wants to use your life. God wants to take you to the next level, but you're stuck. Because every time change is about to take place, you regress. But I'm here to let you know it is possible to change. If you let God. Our mind is so powerful. That's why Paul is, is telling them, look, it's here. A lot has to do right here. Okay, Lord, just a little bit, please. Because our mind is amazing. Mine is so amazing. It records everything. That moment is recorded right there. What you felt, exactly what you felt. If you're embarrassed, whatever, belittled, whatever it was, those emotions, not only that, it smells and all these things. Every, that moment is like frozen in time. It's right here. That's why Paul talks about, too, the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind has to take place. We have thousands and thousands of files up here. For some of you that know about computers and hard drives, we've got so much gigabytes just recorded up here. God has to come. That's why I wash our mind. Wash our mind. The next time, even though you might remember a certain incident, now it's not going to take you to that place where you felt the pain and hurt, betrayal, whatever it was. But it's up to you. I'm going to say a prayer for those that are here. And for those that are watching right now. As a matter of fact, put your hand in your forehead right here. Your mean business. And just say, Lord Jesus, I ask you right now, renew my mind. Remove all those things that are there from my past, God. Those things that continue to haunt me, God. 
those things that continue to stop me dead in my tracks, God. They bring doubt, insecurity, all these other things that don't allow me to succeed, to move forward. And so I pray right now, change my perspective, God, for I am a new man. I am a new woman. And so I know that you're capable, Father, of changing the way I see things, the way I think. And so, Father, once again, I pray for every person right now that made that prayer, God. Let it be so that from this day on, their perspective is going to be totally different, God. Emotions no longer are going to dictate the outcome of the day. And so I pray, Father, strengthen them right now, God. In the name of Jesus, we all say amen and amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord one more good hand of praise. Amen. What a powerful word. A powerful word in having freedom in Christ. A freedom in Christ. And what a powerful word. Thank you, Pastor Luis. Amen. We're going to continue to go forward. Amen. And, and we're just so grateful for everything God is doing in your life and what God is about to do here in the Church of Victory Outreach. Amen. Give the Lord one more good hand of praise. Amen. For that word. At this time, we just got a few more moments, the moment you've all been waiting for. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat real quick. As I call our United We Can uh, coordinators up to the, the pulpit, come on up. Uh, the Aquinos are going to make their way, Douglas and Melinda. They're going to give us some instruction right now. How many are ready for Run for Hope? Come on, ready for Run for Hope? It's time for our giveaways. It's been a powerful, powerful month. They're going to be able to share right now. Stay tuned. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Are we excited? I don't know about you guys. I'm excited. I'm excited. Three of you guys, today's going to be the winner of a TV, a laptop, and a gift card. You guys in the church, and you guys watching on online too. So let's get excited. But before that, I want to say something. Listen to me, please. I'm so grateful, grateful from the bottom of my heart for your faithful giving. Grateful because we couldn't have done it without God and you guys. Thank you so much on behalf of Pastor Luis, Sister Yuri, my wife and myself. Thank you guys for your faithful giving. And please don't stop giving. Continue giving to United We Can. There's a lot of Douglases out there that they need help. I came from the home. I graduated the home. I'm a, you know, I'm a part of the home. And here I am by the grace of God, sober, on my, on my right mind talking to you guys. I mean, I'm able to go to my sister's house and I could sleep in her house because she trusts me now. Before she couldn't trust me. So now, you know what, I'm, it just got, it just got, I'm so excited, amen? So it's my wife. You know, just as my husband said, we are so grateful. Um, this is just an incentive to give back and say thank you. There's so much that we just want to give back and you know, this is just a small part of it. To me, those tickets, it doesn't just represent, you know, an individual. It represents those finances that we raised for United We Can from Run for Hope. It raised what you guys did to be able to touch those that are still lost and hurting, to be able to expand the tent of God's house, to be able to go and create buildings for us, for us to be able to partner with and to be able to continue to grow. And, and you know, there's so many people and so many things that are going on in this world, it's never going to stop. But we can make a difference. You guys are the difference makers. And this just is a piece of what it represents. That's what I see behind it. But we're so excited to give a little portion of what we can. And we're just going to continue to build on this. And I just thank each and every one of you. So let's just get excited right now to be able to call out those numbers. Amen. And so the way we're going to do it, I'm just going to call somebody from the audience. Maybe we could call somebody to make it fair. Let's see. Maybe somebody run up here. Come on. Who are you at? Let's go. Let's go. Uh, Sister Ruby, come on up. 
I'm going to have Sister Ruby come up. We're going to try to make it fair here. Come on, Sister. Sister Ruby. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to have, you, we're going to have Sister Ruby come up, draw three, three tickets, correct? Start with the 50 and then the laptop and the, and the thing. Okay. She's going to draw three, three, one. The first one is for the $50 gift card visa. Now, this is, everybody's names are here. All those that participated in all the giveaways, the tamales, the, the fried bread, everything. So there's thousands of, number of names in here. Hopefully, you're gonna, you're gonna, they're going to pull your name. Sister Ruby, would you do the honors? Real quick, go ahead. Before we do, I just want to reconfirm. Does anybody here in the audience still have tickets not turned in? No? Or forever hold your peace. You got some? Come on, sister. Right now is the time. Yes, we want to definitely make sure that all the tickets are there. So, oh, so, oh that's that back. What's that? Those are the stubs? Oh, that's your stubs. you're good. <laughs> huh? That's Thank good, though. You. Okay, Sister right. Ruby's going to pull. Come on over here, Sister Ruby, to get in the, in the view. And then she's going to pull the first one. This is for the $50 a Visa gift card. All right, here we go. Somebody get excited. Margaret V. Margaret Valdez. Come on now. Praise the Lord. Come on up. Her husband is coming to you. Come on up on stage. On Praise the Lord. Her husband's here on her behalf. God bless you. Okay, this is for real quick. This next one, Sister Ruby's gonna pull. It's for the HP laptop. Come on, somebody. Christina Archete. Christina Arzadi. Come on now. Praise the Lord. Come on, Elka. Come on up. Sylvia, somebody. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's, the, that's prayer right there. Three times a day. Okay, last one. 55, 55 inch TV TLC smart TV. Mixy, they're mixing it up. Somebody get excited. Come on now. Go ahead, Sister Ruby. No pressure. <laughs> Who is it? Oh, it's really small. It is Andrew Contreras. <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a good hand of praise. Amen. Come on, get up here. Praise the Lord. Amen. A, a 55 inch. This is coming home with you, brother. Come on now. Come on, run for hope. Come on, run for hope. What a powerful time we had. I'm going to turn it back over to our coordinators. They got a quick announcement. Praise the Lord. Amen. What's this? In the middle. We raised over $16,000. Best of all, we raised it in less than two months. Imagine what you can do if you start partnering with us now. For next year, imagine how much we could raise. You know, put that in your mind of we could start now. Because you know what? At the end of the day, this it never stops. This this what we do each and every day for God's ministry, it never stops. So don't stop now. Let's start pulling together, coming together, and raising those funds for next year. Uh, if you don't know what Run for Hope was. Run for Hope was an event held each year for us to be able to raise those funds for United We Can. United We Can is a ministry that we basically utilize to help with the mission fields. There's so many things that United We Can does. It doesn't stop in one area. There's so many things for me to even mention. But you know what? For more information, I encourage you to go to victoryoutreach.org. If you haven't partnered with us, I highly encourage you to start. If you need more information, we're here to be able to answer any questions. You can register online. You can also um, do your finances through online. You don't have to go somewhere to drop off money or even here. You can have it automatically debited. It's how you want to set it up. You can do it reoccurring. You can do it one time. You can start at a dollar a day. Whatever helps and, and support the ministry. If God puts in your heart, helps us all together be united. 
this is the reason why we call it United We Can, because we truly are united with this. So I thank you, you know, Pastor and Sister Judy, they thank you. We all thank you for Victory Outreach Hemet for all you've done and you continue to do. Thank you very much. Right, let's close out in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for what an amazing time you've given us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for everything you've done, Father God. Father God, Jesus, I just want to pray, Father God. Uh, Father God, tonight just let us rejoice in you today, Father God, Jesus. Let us, uh, let us just uh, be excited for everything you've done for us, Father God, Jesus. I pray, Father God, Jesus, that you bless every single one of us tonight, Father God. When you go to bed during the day, Father God. Father God, Jesus, I pray that uh, you give us all the mercies on the way home, Father God. Keep us safe for the rest of the week, Father God, Jesus. And allow us, Father God, to continue, Father God, continue putting our faith on you, Father God, Jesus. And thank you, Father God, for everything you are about to do. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen and amen. You are dismissed. Yourself dismissed. God bless you.